Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We appreciate everyone here for City Council. It looks like we've got a full house, we've got a bunch of scouts, and we're excited to have you here. I'm sure you're excited to be here. You know, I can tell. But uh, we'd like to uh, first start with, uh, we've asked Gary Briggs come up and uh, give us our inspirational message and prayer. So if you'd like to come up now. Good to meet with all of you. Appreciate this opportunity. Appreciate the invitation. Now I was told I had 30 minutes. Is that right? <laughs> hey, you can take whatever you want. Okay. But they might boo you after a while. <laughs> well, it's good to see these young people behind me here. It's good to see them here. I just like to uh, the comments I'm going to share with the council and with the uh, uh, the uh, congregation behind me and those uh, in the viewing audience. Uh, I want to attribute to Lloyd Newell's uh, one of his messages that I really appreciated, especially as we start the year of 2015. And I hope everyone listens listens to the message and acts upon it. As far as uh, our civic responsibilities here in this wonderful uh, town of Spanish Fork as we uh, work together to share a common purpose. The story goes, as another new year rolled around, a middle-aged man sat quietly in his favorite chair. I've changed some names here, uh, so no offense taken. <laughs> Cheryl noticed him staring ahead with a thoughtful look on his face and said, Stephen, you look troubled. Is there something on your mind? Yes, he replied. Here we are at the beginning of another year, and it doesn't look like it will be any different from the last one or the one before that. It makes me wonder how much meaning my life really has. I feel like I work hard every day, but what's the real purpose of it all? It's not unusual to sometimes feel this way. We all want to make meaningful contributions, but sometimes we wonder whether our efforts even matter. In response to such desires to live a more fulfilling life, some might turn inward, focusing more on satisfying their personal desires. They may seek meaning in recreation, entertainment, or the comforts and pleasures of life. Ultimately, however, their pursuits tend to leave them even more dissatisfied than before. Other people take a different approach. They choose to leave the safe confines of their usual comfortable life and turn outward in selfless service. Some are skilled medical workers, farmers, teachers, or business managers, and some have little more to offer than their time or a willing heart. Some travel to developing countries and some feel, find opportunities to serve in their own neighborhoods, but they all have certain time, things in common. They want to make life better for someone else, and they're willing to do it. They always come away feeling richly compensated and they rarely wonder if their life has purpose. Human beings have a special capacity to recognize the needs of others. This, if sometimes we can freely offer, even if it is only a smile and a word of encouragement. This is how we ascend to a more purposeful life, by reaching out to lift someone else. A well-known line of poetry says it best, I'll lift you and you lift me and we'll both ascend together. Now, to all here and listening, Spanish Fork is a great city. I love the people. It's got great people. And I know that we can accomplish this in 2015, and each of us can do better as we reach and help our neighbors, our neighborhood, especially our community. The Spanish Fork can be all that it can be, and even better in 2015. So our purpose is to make Spanish Fork even better. Let's rise together. And I leave that message with you. Our Father in Heaven, we pause the beginning of this Spanish Fork City Council meeting to unitedly express our gratitude to Thee for all the many blessings that we enjoy. We're grateful for the good people who participate and work and volunteer in this wonderful city. We pray that they will be blessed for their efforts, that they will recognize the value of their contribution to this wonderful community. We're grateful for those elected officials before us, and we pray that this night, as they go over agenda items, that they will be inspired, 
that thou will find them worthy of inspiration, that their hearts and minds will be touched to do the right things for the betterment of Spanish Fork. We're grateful for their time and for their talents and skills that they contribute. We're grateful for all those who serve and work and volunteer in this wonderful community. Bless them. May we unitedly have a common purpose and that we might rise together is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, Gary. I've asked Richard Davis to lead us in the pledge. Will the audience please arise? Will the audience please repeat the Pledge of Allegiance with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. We can uh, move to uh, public comment. Anybody would like to come up and talk to us? Carrie, come on, don't be shy. Well, good, I do. I'm going to take a moment here and just thank Carrie, as everybody, or if they don't know, that Carrie uh, was our director of the Chamber of Commerce and has resigned to take a, another position, and we're going to miss her. And we tried to think of ways to thank you and uh, tell you how much we appreciate all the work you've done. And so what this is, we've come up with, we're going to have a Spanish Fork City proclamation declaring January 8, 2015 as Carrie Hanks Day. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, you got one now. <laughs> Whereas, Carrie Hanks has been serving as the executive director of the Spanish Fork Area, Salem Area Chamber of Commerce since January 2011. And whereas, Carrie Hanks has taken a new position, will soon be leaving the Chamber of Commerce. And whereas, during Carrie Hanks' tenure with the Chamber of Commerce, membership of the chambers in, has increased over 40 percent. And whereas, Carrie Hanks' leadership and guidance has helped all businesses in the community, large and small. And whereas the Spanish Fork Mayor and City Council have constantly relied on Carrie's advice and representing for business communities, and her voice and her leadership will be missed. Whereas the City of Spanish Fork and the Spanish Fork Salem Area Chamber of Commerce are better today because of Carrie's time and leadership. Now, therefore, I, Steve Lifeson, Mayor of Spanish Fork City, hereby proclaim January 8, 2015, to be Carrie Hanks Day in Spanish Fork. Well, thank you. What do you say about something like that? Um, Not a whole lot. I'm deeply honored. Thank you so much. Uh, I do have to correct you, though. It's been since uh, October 2009 since I was in <laughs> the hey, I director just, of the chamber. I just read what they give me. <laughs> Seth, you messed up. Oh. But anyway, it's been an honor and a privilege to uh, work with the chamber and work with the boards. Uh, we've had, you know, people, their volunteer positions, they come and go. But they've done a remarkable job, I think, of uh, promoting Spanish work and helping businesses to grow. Um, it's the main focus of the chamber. And I've been very honored and happy to have been a part of that organization and, and of the city. And I appreciate uh, having my own day that's great <laughs> and i want to thank you all for all the support you've given the chamber and myself over the years so thank you so much thank you thank you, you carrie yeah. appreciate you okay is there anybody else that would like to come up and address the council come up
Thank you. Mr. Mayor and City Council, my name is Robert Pegnani. I'm the Utah Elks uh, Veterans Chairman, and I'm also a member of the Governor's Advisory uh, Board on Veterans and Military Affairs. Essentially, this is a thank you and also an invite. This is our third annual Music from the Heart for our Veterans, and we couldn't have done it without uh, Spanish Fork City Council and the town of, or the city of Spanish Fork supporting us. With the funds that we raised last year, with the cooperation of the American Legion, Hand in Hand, the Diamond Fork uh, Rodeo Club, just to name a few, we were able to send and take care of 600 veterans and their families throughout the year, taking them on fishing trips, horseback riding trips. Uh, we were able to take 23 female veterans who have been sexually assaulted in the military on a retreat with counseling, and we took 23 children who have lost a parent due to suicide or killed in action during the war. And again, we want to thank you very much. What we're doing is we're inviting you because we're going to have our third annual music from the heart at your great Ponderosa building over here across the street. And uh, our goal this year and focus this year is to raise funds for suicide prevention. Nationally, we're losing 22 veterans every day to suicide. Uh, if you watch the news right before we came in, there is a, a lockdown right at, at one of our VA centers right now with a veteran in El Paso, Texas. It has been uh, such an epidemic and everything. We even lost a veteran that was home three days from the war. So we'd like to invite you, the community and everything to come out and support us on February 7th from 11 to three over across the street. And like you say, our goal is suicide prevention. And if we can reduce it by one number, we think we're gonna you know, be successful. And as we look at it is that we did not lose our veterans when they were deployed and we do not want to lose them when they come home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Anyone else like to come up? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to council comments. Uh, Councilman Hall. Um, maybe just to follow up a little bit with uh, honoring Carrie today and, and creating her day. Um, I'd like to make sure and recognize some of our board members that are here. I don't want to embarrass you too much there, but, uh, but maybe stand up. Uh, Becky McConnell is our uh, retiring president of the Chamber of Commerce, and she's done a great year here in 2014. And uh, Carrie can attest to the help that she has been to the chamber and, and, and the director as well. Um, Susan. Taylor has been a board member uh, for, geez, Susan, <laughs> since the inception of the chamber. But uh, Susan's been been great and and is retiring from the board uh, this year. Susan, is that right? I mean, at least one year they're keeping me on. I can't. I've been on long enough. I have to have a year out. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, you got Brent Wignall, uh, who's a member of our. Uh, our board uh, for the Chamber of Commerce and been a great asset uh, to us. Randy Kaufman back there is our assistant to, to the director and done a great job this past year as well. Um, I, I saw Todd Dickerson in here earlier who's a, a board member uh, and uh, I think Chris Baird was here as well who's a, a board member. Uh, that's just some of the board members that showed up here today but uh, just to publicly thank uh, Carrie on a day like this and um, the um, what Carrie usually does is turn around and thank the uh, the board members like she did here today that volunteer their time as well to further the, the business community so publicly uh, here in City Council today your your praises can't be rung loud enough for Carrie as the director and for you businesses you, you board members here in the, the Chamber of Commerce that uh, have done so much uh, throughout the past year but the past years of service as well uh, with Carrie so uh, thank you. Thank you from the city side of it. Again, I, it feels kind of odd doing that because I'm just one of you guys. I come from the, the Chamber of Commerce and, um, and uh, love you guys for all that you do for the, for the city and for the business community. So thank you. Um, other than that, we have uh, the, the, the board meeting for the Chamber coming up uh, this week, this Thursday morning, um, where uh, we'll discuss the issues coming up and, uh, and try to 
fill some very big shoes left by <laughs> Carrie as well and, and uh, talk to those uh, people applying for the directorship. So other than that, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Scope. Uh, Mayor, just a couple of things. Uh, first, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, what a great time to live in Spanish Fork. We've got some great activities throughout the year with uh, Champions Challenge, Fiesta Days, Harvest Moon Hurrah, just things off the top of the head, but really just a, a great 2015 ahead of us as a, as a city and a community. Um, the only business to report on this Thursday, uh, I will be attending the airport board meeting. Uh, different things on the agenda. Uh, we'll have our, uh, our usual facilities report, financial report. Uh, and then we'll be talking about the, ap the apron rehab uh, that's going on there at the, uh, the airport on the, the tarmac. Uh, those are really about the, the biggest things on the agenda, fairly small agenda, and I will report on that in the next meeting. That's all. Thank you. Councilman Dart. Uh, let's not forget the county fair since we have our county commissioner here with us uh, that we have during the year. We're grateful to have that here. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what kind of what Gary talked about. Um, last week or so, we had a fairly good-sized snowstorm, and I noticed the the people on my street uh, helping neighbors and so forth dig out. And uh, I would encourage you, no matter where you live, to <coughs> look around, see who needs some help, and uh, get after it and help clear their sidewalks and driveways. Uh, I know it was greatly appreciated in my neighborhood. And so, uh, like Gary said, let's rise together. Thank you, that's all I have. Councilman Davis. I wanted to talk a little bit about the same thing Councilman Dart was talking about. Uh, it was good during them snowstorms to see people going out and helping each other and, and, and shoveling the snows. And I also appreciate our city people going out and, and plowing our roads like they did. They, you know, we had those two great big storms, you know, uh, Christmas Day and uh, the next day. And, and to be up, you know, before Christmas, you know, doing those roads like that. But I appreciate the citizens doing that. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday with our Fiesta Days. Uh, that's moving on. And I want to say that we have our theme for this year. And this year's theme is, is Feels Like Home. We're working on the logo on it now and trying to get that done. We've also chose our Grand Marshals for this year. This year's Grand Marshal will be Clyde and Norma Nielsen. So we're pretty proud of those, those two people. and all that they've done for the community of Spanish Fork and all the wonderful things that they've done. So we're gonna be happy for them. Uh, we've got a couple of new items that's gonna happen during Fiesta Days and we're working on that and trying to iron those uh, new programs out. But it's gonna be another great event. We're hoping that we will be again the number one event in the state. Um, and that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Gordon. Mayor. Oh, uh, Councilman Gordon. Just echo <laughs> what Mike said about Carrie. You know, wonderfully will be missed much and really appreciate you and everything you've done. We know you're not going away though. It's not like it's a funeral because <laughs> we we know you too well. So that's all I have, Mayor. Great. Is it up the top? Uh, oh, there it is. I got it. Okay, we're going to go back up. Um, I skipped over a thing here. You know, I was so excited with your proclamation there, Carrie, that I almost forgot the other one that we were doing. And so we are going to do a, <clears throat> another proclamation. And let me read this again. Spanish Fork City Proclamation declaring January 9th, 2015 as Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. Whereas Spanish Fork City maintains a police department which provides valuable service to the community and its residents, 
These acts of service are many. They range from meeting individual citizens' needs to providing education and awareness to protecting life and property. All of these services make our community safer and whereas each day when a police officer goes to work, they know that they can face extreme dangerous, dangerous situations that sometimes life and death decisions are made, must be made on a moment's notice. And whereas each year in the United States over 100 officers lose their lives and as many as 203 officers have lost their lives in a single year while in the line of duty providing services to the community they serve. And whereas approximately 50,000 officers are assaulted while in the line of duty each year in the United States. Whereas approximately 14,000 officers are injured in the line of duty each year in the United States. Whereas officers face verbal abuse on a routine basis, yet must, main, must remain professional, courteous, and caring. And whereas officers pay an integral role in our society in enforcing the laws and keeping the peace, everything from acts of service providing to law-abiding citizens to taking justified actions against felonious predators and whereas being an officer is often, often a thankless job, often with low pay, difficult hours, and little appreciation for what they do. Now, therefore, the City of Spanish Fork, Spanish Fork City Council issues the following proclamation. January 9, 2015 is hereby proclaimed to be Law Enforcement Appreciation Day in Spanish Fork City. As a mayor and city council, we encourage our residents to show their appreciation for law enforcement personnel. That appreciation may be shown in various ways, including but not limited to the following. Thank a police officer. Wear blue clothing in support of law enforcement. Send a card or letter of support to a local police agency. Share a positive story about a law enforcement experience on social media. Be vocal about your support for law enforcement, both in person, via social media. Use your creativity to show support for law enforcement in a positive way. So, we're very pleased with our police officers, especially here in Spanish War, and the job that they do. And so I think this is one way we can show our appreciation to our law enforcement and show our support to you. So. Uh, January 9th, it's your day. So pass that on to all our police officers and let them know how much we appreciate them. Okay. All right. I have a few things I'd like to discuss or talk about. This being a new year, this is our first council of the year. I'd like to look back on some of the accomplishments that the city of Spanish Fork had in 2014. And so I think first I'd like to, to talk about or say that we had a great honor where we were ranked the number one city in Utah to live by an agency. and. Uh, we're excited for that because we knew, we all that live here know exactly what a great city it is and it's finally nice to have recognition. Other thing that we had, we had the Champions Challenge reading program in every elementary school in Spanish Fork in April and May. Uh, this was a unique opportunity where the children got to read books and, and then they got to go to the Champions Challenge. And that uh, went nationwide. They thought that was a great, thing that we did there. We had the Championship uh, Challenge Rodeo in May, Champions Challenge Rodeo in May. We had successful Fiesta Days. We had 35 straight sellout rodeo performance over eight years. Um, that's pretty neat, neat to see. Um, SFCN has had their home, whole home DVR. And also they had, they went to all digital conversion turning off the analog in October. 
We have live HD high school sports with our drone camera. We received funding to complete the river trail from the golf course to the sports park. Uh, we were ex extremely successful with the Play Unplug program launched by the Spanish Fork Salem Mary Chamber of Commerce. And a lot to thank to Carrie for that. And if people don't know, that's who she's going to go work for. So I'm sure we'll see that again, won't we, Carrie? Yeah. All right. Uh, construction began on over 200,000 feet of retail space. Stores like Walmart, Good Earth, Five Guys, Joann's, Colbert's, and more. Uh, almost 200 new homes were constructed. Uh, constructed the West Electric distribu Distribution Line that allowed the west side of the city to receive power from two different sources, or two different directions. We had the aeroplane trains automobile party at the airport in September, the Harvest Moon Hurrah. We hosted another wonderful Utah County Fair and a demolition derby and we're grateful for our partnership with the, the county and Utah County and we look forward to continue that with Commissioner Ellerson. Appreciate you being here. Um, we resurfaced 10 miles of road. Now we've probably got some of the best roads in the, the state and uh, we've got a great crew that comes and takes care of that for us. In fact, we have other cities come and try to learn from our city what we're doing to do it right. And so it's pretty awesome that we did that. Uh, redeveloped a major spring for the city and provided up over a thousand acre feet of water for use in the city. This allows us to gravity feed another 27% of our pressurized irrigation water. We had our K-9 unit, Officer Grover and Lord, for a complete year. Many of our children may have seen them as Officer Grover has been to several schools teaching our children about Officer Lord and his abilities. He has been deployed nearly 200 times of which, um, and been instrumental in 84 arrests and found three sp suspects that were hiding from the police, one of them which was a kidnap kidnapping suspect. Eleven of our police officers will receive a life-saving award this year as their individual acts help someone's life um, and live another day. Our police, police department is busier than it's ever been. Last year they responded to 21,435 calls for service. This year they have had 23,004 calls for service. So. Um, and our emergency preparedness officer has been meeting with local religious leaders helping to prepare for the unknown disaster or emergencies that may arise. A citywide drill will take place in April as we participated in the great Utah shakeout. Those are just a thumbnail of things that happened in the city last year and we're, we, uh, we're really grateful for all the citizens and for everyone that participated and helped make this city, like the survey said, the number one city in, in, in the state. And we'll take it, because we deserve it. All right, now moving on. Spanish Fork 101. Several months ago, we talked a little bit about a few different things that were happening in the city relative to economic development and new stores that were coming. And um, a couple of months after that, we thought it'd be good to follow up maybe around the first part of January just to update people on what's happening in uh, particularly the northern part of the community where we've really had a lot of activity over the course of the past year. 2014 uh, was uh, a tremendous year in terms of new square footage that was constructed for all different types of retail businesses in the city. And in all candor, a couple of months ago, I really expected to be able to present new information tonight on new stores that we're aware of that are coming, but frankly, there's really not a lot to share. Um, we had a spurt about this time last year when uh, we got familiar 
with specific plans that different companies had, uh, many of which are now open and, and doing business, mm -hmm. things like Good Earth, uh, Five Guys, different uh, establishments like that. So uh, given that there's not a lot new to share, um, I think on the agenda we titled this commercial development facts. I'm going to try to keep it as factual as I can and really only share things that we've learned from the different companies that I'll talk about themselves. Um, and uh, I'll start with the bad news and then end with uh, some things that you're familiar with already, but some outstanding news that we just received a little bit more information on today. Uh, but the bad news is that, to our knowledge, there are no plans for anybody to construct a fine dining, sit-down restaurant in the community today. We certainly hope that will change. Um, I can attest to the community that when you meet with commercial developers, you ask about that. Um, we don't miss an opportunity to try to encourage, influence, pressure, uh, coerce, do anything <coughs> we can try to get people to get us on the map relative to um, uh, maybe helping to land a business like um, Olive Garden, Red Lobster, uh, or someplace that serves red meat, um, Outback, Longhorn, different places like that. Um, and again, um, for the community's benefit, uh, I, I will attest to the fact that you do your job, I think. I think we, we've done as much as we can, and we've talked before about some of the factors that have, have played into um, how long it's taken for fine dining to, to maybe happen here, uh, but we hope that changes. Uh, so that's the bad news. Get that out of the way now, and hopefully we can share something different uh, in upcoming months. To some good news. I um, have a few dates here that I'll share relative to some things that, that aren't really new, um, but just uh, in terms of when we expect some businesses that, that we know are coming will open. So let me start with Cafe Zupas. Um, right now their plan is to open on February 11th. Completely excited about that. Uh, Walmart. You know, we had hoped that they would be open by now. It's taken a little bit longer to get to where uh, they'll be open than I think what we anticipated months ago. But March 11th right now is their anticipated opening date. Joann's, um, been under construction for a while. Right now they're located on Main Street at the corner of 4th North. They'll be moving to uh, a property that's just west of Macy's in the Spanish Fork Marketplace development. They plan to open on March 6th. Cubbies uh, should open much sooner than the others. In just a couple of weeks on January 20th. Um, Malawi's Pizza, they're a few months behind the ones I've talked about. It's probably going to be sometime in April or May before they're open. Um, the Nebo Credit Union probably will open early next month, be ready for business. So just a little update by way of uh, some, some dates and when people can, can look to be able to patronize some of these new businesses. Um, and Culver's, thank you. Culver's opened yesterday. Talked a little bit about that before. Uh, some of us have been there at least once already. Um, excited to have them in the community, um, as we are all of the businesses. And I hope that goes without saying. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in Spanish Fork. Um, not as much as we'd like. You know, we had a Longhorn Steakhouse or something like that, but we're getting there. Uh, but again, diversity, uh, broad base of different types of businesses, different types of restaurants, retail establishments, and that's that's only improving as these open. Um, uh, we as the city care a lot about retail development for many different reasons. Certainly one of the big ones is quality of life. Um, simply the idea that our residents can patronize local businesses, uh, comfort and ease of having those located close to their home versus needing to travel. You know, it typically has been uh, to community, communities that are further north in the county here. Um, but also revenue um, is, uh, is always a concern for us as we look for as many ways as possible to provide as high a level of service as we can with all of the things that the city does. 
and car dealerships potentially play a big role in that. And we're very, very excited that um, on February 1, if not even maybe a few days earlier, the Doug Smith Spanish Fork Autoplex will open in Spanish Fork. They'll feature Dodge, Jeep, Chrysler, and the Chevrolet dealership that currently is being operated by Minholt Chevrolet. Um, the ownership of that Minholt dealership will be transferred to Doug Smith. And um, it's hard to overstate how tremendous that that likely will be for the community over time to have a company uh, that has a presence in this county like Doug Smith here in Spanish Fork with those brands, you know, some of which being brought back to Spanish Fork um, uh, to a part of the world where, um, as we understand it, uh, those entities feel like they will do very, very well here. So that's, that's tremendously good news for us that hasn't necessarily been a secret at all. Um, but today was the first day that, that we learned that, again, February 1st is, is going to be the day. Um, they already have some signage up and so forth on the property on North Main, which really has been turnkey and ready to go for Doug Smith to bring those new brands or, or additional brands back to Spanish Fork. And we're really excited about that. So that's what we have by way of commercial development facts. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take those. Okay. Will Walmart, the opening of Walmart, facilitate some new businesses coming in, do you think? Uh, yeah, I appreciate the way you put that. In my opinion, absolutely. Uh, traffic patterns in that part of the community will start to change. Um, we look for that to make a difference. And again, I'm, I'm trying not to speculate too much. That, I think, likely is going to be kind of a game changer. It's no secret that theaters have talked about doing something here as well. Um, we start to hear more and more through the grapevine about um, a theater maybe being uh, more ready to start construction. And, and when it comes to things like restaurants, typically they follow uh, those types of entertainment uses pretty closely. So that could be another thing that would really help bring about some of the change that I think a lot of residents in Spanish Fork really would like to see. Good. Thanks, Dave. Dave. Consent items. What do you want? Thank you, Jenny. Okay, the first item we have is the UDOT local government contract. We received a MAG grant to rebuild the cut bridge at the end of Center Street, also to widen out that intersection so that it will have a much higher capacity. And this is the grant agreement to go along with that. Any questions about that? We plan to do construction uh, this summer on, on that bridge widening and redoing the intersection. How long will it be closed? Is that in the bid documents right now, it's not bid out quite yet, but it, it says that the bridge can only be closed for five weeks, and that will be during the summer when, the, uh, when school's out. So. Pre or post Fiesta days, just thinking about the parade route starting at the top of there. Do you know? Probably pre. Close. It would have to be pre, right? Yeah. Okay. Just it, it might even go through Fiesta okay. days. So. Gotcha. But that's not. It's not. That's on the other side. On the, the route. Road. It's right. Yeah. Right. Uh, is there a? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember. I think we've seen the plans. But is there a sidewalk component that goes with that to make it yes. safer for those kids to get across Highway Six into their school right there? Yeah, there's actually a pretty wide sidewalk that is protected by a Jersey barrier type concrete barrier from the traffic, and so it should be very very safe for pedestrians to go across that that bridge uh, our stays. two most important council members live on that side of the <laughs> <laughs> brandon has a lot of answering to do on sundays usually about this so the project rebuilds this bridge it widens it to five lanes plus a pedestrian way here on the north side of the bridge it also widens out this intersection and builds a new signal. 
so that there's five lanes coming from this direction as well. Uh, this whole intersection should operate a lot better uh, after this and the bridge will be much safer. It also uh, improves this intersection quite a bit. So. You're going to be able to get your water line extended through that? Through the girders? Yes. Talk about? Yes. So the I thought that was an important part of it. it. And it really is. At, at one time there was a, a utility bridge right here um, that failed. And so we've stubbed all the utilities here in anticipation of putting them in the girders of this bridge, and, and that is part of the project. So water line, pressurized irrigation, electrical, uh, all of that will be in Chris, communication. Address the separation of the two projects this year and next year. Center Street Bridge this year, Center Street Lower Park next year. Okay, so we were hopeful to do some some work here and, and build a signal here. And uh, uh, that we couldn't afford, in the, in the grant money that we received, we could not afford to do the signal here. So in the next year or, or two, we will be looking at uh, widening options or restriping options along here and a possible signal here uh, should be done in the, in the next couple of years, so. Any more questions about Cutbridge? All right, uh, the next item is, is a professional services agreement with Hales Engineering. Uh, this is just an update of our old professional services agreement. We made some changes to it. So before we do any contract work with any consultants, we require them to have a new professional services agreement with those updates with us. Any questions about that? And then uh, item D, a non-disclosure agreement with First Solutions. First Solutions is a broadband company out of Idaho. Uh, they've come to us uh, uh, wanting to discuss some options that, that they might be able to present to us and has asked for a non-disclosure agreement so that those discussions might be confidential. And then the last item is uh, a lease agreement, uh, the McKell lease agreement. Uh, this property owner would like to lease a section of Sorry. a section a section of a public right of way that is anticipated to be public right of way, but probably many, many, many years from now. And uh, the lease is cancel. We can cancel the lease within 60 days, and he'll maintain the property. And and so uh, we don't see any problem with that as long as we can use it for right away when we need it, if we need it. There is a chance that the road would go another direction, in which case we wouldn't need it. And so, any questions about that? Just one question: that that lease, the McKell lease, uh, commences or it should be commencing January 1 of 2015, is that correct? Yeah, and we'll just change that to the date that it's signed by the mayor. Okay, I did, it had 14 here, I don't know if that was. It should be 15. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Motion to approve the consent items. Got a motion by Councilman Gordon, a second by Councilman Dart, all in favor, say aye. 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 Great. All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn to redevelopment. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Davis, a second by Councilman Gordon. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, we are now in RDA. Motion to approve the consent items. Second. 
We've got a motion by Councilman Davis, a second by Councilman Gordon to approve the consent items. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We've got a uh, items here uh, to be considered by agency to be routine and to be enacted by a single motion. So, uh, you want to come up, Junior, and tell us what we're doing here on so this public have, hearing? We've had a request from uh, Young Living Farms to create a community de development area. It's what we call a CDA within the redevelopment agency. This is to allow them to expand their business. So we just heard recently from Dave talking about how we like uh, our commercial establishments, our retail establishments. We also like our industrial establishments. They're the ones who provide uh, a pretty strong property tax base. They also provide employment, which is just so critical when we're growing as fast as we've been growing. So we've uh, been working with them for several months now to uh, accommodate their request. You can see the area on the map. Uh, the white large building there is their existing building. They propose to expand that, and they're asking for some help. And so we have put together a project area plan. So the first item that we'll need to do, is, as I sit down there, is we'll need to open up and have a public hearing. And uh, as we get in that public hearing, Dave Anderson again will we'll go through the plan and, uh, and those things. So I won't jump into to his ballywick there. But the purpose of the public hearing is to allow property owners within the area and those uh, immediately adjacent to make any notes that they have to make any objections. At this point, uh, I need to report, to, uh, actually I, I should refer to you now as the chair since we're in the redevelopment agency portion of the meeting and you've all put on a different hat now. Uh, but the agency has received no written objections to this proposed plan, nor am I aware of any oral objections. So tonight will be the last night that we can take public comment and, uh, and see if there are any. Uh, following the close of the public hearing, we need to do uh, uh, several things. We need to first of all adopt uh, a resolution which approves the plan. Uh, that's on the agenda. You have a copy of that in your packets. Then we need to re review and approve uh, several interlocal agreements. And when we get to that point, I'll review those with you at that time. So with that said, it would be appropriate now to uh, open the public hearing and turn the time over to, to Dave. He'll give his presentation. We take public comment, and we can proceed that way. Thank you. Okay. Motion to go into public hearing. Second. Got a motion by uh, Councilman Davis, a second by Councilman Scove. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, Dave. Thank you. I'm just talking a little bit more about the project area plan that Junior just referenced. Uh, but before I do that, let me make note, uh, just for your benefit and, and the record, that you have an updated version of the feasibility plan for the project. There were two changes that were made after things were brought to our attention by Young Living. Um, I don't believe they're, they're terribly substantive. Uh, we updated the square footage of their existing building. Um, and we, we changed uh, one of the numbers on the, the minimum anticipated capital investment portion of the document. Um, none of the changes impact, I think, uh, what I'll talk about right now. But I just wanted to mention that you do have that updated uh, feasibility plan. With that said, uh, Junior just touched on some of the, the main points of the project. He mentioned that we're talking about uh, a parcel that's owned by one entity, which does make this easier than it potentially could be. It's a 12.8 acre site. Young Living currently has a facility on the property of approximately 100,000 square feet in size. They're looking to add space to that, um, perhaps in a couple of phases, um, roughly 100,000 square feet in each phase, should they choose to phase it. Um, the subject property currently is zoned industrial one and the expansion that Young Living's contemplating here in Spanish Fork is uh, consistent with our zoning provisions. We'd certainly allow that type of use to occur as it currently is happening uh, at that particular location. Um, should the project be approved and Young Living decide to proceed in Spanish Fork with the expansion, 
uh, we would guess that they would uh, invest something between 15 and 28 million dollars in the expansion um, in uh, going to the square footages that I just mentioned um, uh, and uh, I guess with that said, I'd like to just take a real quick minute. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but maybe Seth, if you could help um, with that graph that we have from that one slide, just to talk a little bit about uh, tax increment. And that's really what this agreement ultimately boils down to, or this project with this plan and the agreement uh, that we'll talk about. Is it gone? No, but it's not working right Okay. Does it? So, for example, right now, obviously Young Living, they have a facility on the property and they're paying property tax on that existing facility. Um, so we might refer to what they're currently paying as, as the base. Now, with an expansion, with new investment, uh, the building becoming larger with them putting additional equipment in the building and different things like that, the taxes that they'll pay, either through real property tax or personal property tax, those will increase. And that increase is what we'll talk about now in terms of what's above the base. So everything that we see here above the base is intended to represent new tax that will be, will be created with this expansion. And just to be clear with uh, an arrangement like this, um, we're only talking about new tax that will be generated. So we're gonna talk about how some of this, this new tax revenue will be used by Young Living to help them facilitate this expansion here in Spanish Fork. And that's one way that we as a municipality and uh, as different communities in Utah can help be competitive with other states and different incentives that they might offer to companies to expand or relocate to, to places uh, in different locales. Um, when we talk about incentives for economic development, this is really typically what we're talking about. It is tax increment. And that increment, that is, that's, that's the difference between what currently uh, a site is generating in terms of property and personal tax and what would be generated if a project happens. So again, that's, that's represented by these portions of this chart that are identified as taxing entities and agencies. So with that said, um, what's proposed is that 32% uh, of any new tax that will be generated with this expansion will go to the existing taxing entities just like the base taxes do, what we're currently getting. And those different entities are things like Spanish Fork City, um, the Nebo School District, different irrigation districts, uh, the Central Utah Water Project people, uh, and perhaps Utah County, um, different entities like that. Um, now there's obviously another portion as well, and as proposed, 65% of the new tax would be after Young Living meets criteria that are identified in the plan, be given to Young Living as a way to help them justify the investment in our community and simply to make the finances work. And from my perspective, it's, it's even much more important to that. That's partly how we as a city are competitive with communities in other states where I know uh, cities, uh, counties, states, for example, they'll help facilitate a company having free land to expand. Uh, and they'll do other things to, to really try to incentivize companies to locate jobs in their jurisdictions. So this is how we make an effort to compete with that. Um, the last thing I wanna point out about this chart is that you can see you have the base taxes, those go on forever, but also the longevity of the plan is limited. At some point in time, Young Living would conceivably receive all that they're going to receive um, by way of assistance from this project. And at that point in time, the taxing entities receive <coughs> all of the personal and property tax. Um, in this case, we're talking about a project that would last for 10 years. Um, so from that perspective, uh, just speaking for myself and how I see it um, through the city's eyes, 
um, it's an opportunity for us to kind of jumpstart a project with the understanding that we will forego some new tax for a period of time with the understanding that at the end of that period, uh, us and all of the other taxing entities would receive all of the tax benefit as well as the other benefits that are talked about in the plan and the analysis in terms of having additional employees in the community and everything that, that comes with that. So that's maybe the end of my little 101 on, on tax increment. But um, again, 10 years is the anticipated time frame for the project. Um, there is a limit by way of the, the maximum that Young Living could receive. Um, it's $1.71 million. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, as proposed, uh, the breakdowns, uh, 30 to 65, there's a 3% uh, uh, administrative fee that largely goes to the legal people that, that prepared these documents. Um, and uh, Junior, let me ask, am I missing anything that you think I need to point out or talk about? about? Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, you know, a key component for us as staff as we look at these uh, types of opportunities is um, that uh, it really is a competitive field. Uh, in this case, um, we know that there's a community in Idaho that's presented Young Living with a pretty attractive opportunity, and that's really um, what's brought this about. This is our response to that uh, that opportunity that exists for Young Living. Um, from my perspective, I uh, am grateful that Young Living has given us the opportunity to respond. We could talk about some other companies, I won't mention any by name, that you know, really we learned that they were leaving Spanish Fork after the decision had been made. And we weren't given an opportunity to, to try to help them have reasons to stay here. Um, that's not the case tonight. Uh, it is an opportunity, like Junior said, for us to to help an existing company that certainly is a good corporate member of the community expand here. Um, this is something that we would certainly do for other companies if they were in a like situation. Um, and it is, it, it's coming about because we're trying to compete with another location um, that's in another state. Um, again, uh, I feel like uh, there's something that I'm missing, but I think that's basically it. Uh, Obviously, you opened up a public hearing. Junior mentioned that uh, we didn't receive any written uh, protests of any kind. So I think at this point in time, we just take public comment. Okay. Um, I know uh, Mr. Ron Harris, a representative of Young Living's here, along with Neil Robinson. I don't know if you'd want them maybe to take a minute at the onset of the hearing, maybe to, to provide a little bit of additional background, but they. Sure. That's what we'll back. Right. Yeah. You guys like to come up? Good, good seeing you again. Good to see you. Um, I'm Ron Harris, uh, Vice President of Real Estate and Facilities for Young Living Essential Oils. This is Neil Robinson. Yeah, I'm Senior Vice President with Newmark Grubb. We're a commercial real estate firm and have had the honor of working with Young Living for over 10 years. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I want to thank Spanish Fork. Appreciate the uh, efforts have been made to come out and visit the facility. Uh, we built this uh, facility that we're in uh, approximately seven years ago, and uh, um, we've uh, been attracted to Spanish Fork. Uh, I don't live in Spanish Fork, but we like having a business here. And uh, that'll change. We can get you. <laughs> <laughs> you might. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate that. Your staff has been uh, when we made the decision to uh, go from another community and relocate this. Uh, facility uh, to Spanish Fork. Um, your staff was outstanding in helping us to uh, make that uh, that switch, make that change, and to move forward. We needed to move forward on a timely basis to handle our growth at that time, uh, meeting with members of the school district uh, uh, and with the members of the council. Uh, uh, we've tried also, by the way, to be good citizens. We hope that, uh, uh, that you uh, Feel like we're a good member of your community we try and keep that property clean and to be uh, good to our employees and to uh, and uh, uh, carrying on a, a uh, business that we think uh, really uh, improves lives so um, I'm assuming you're all familiar with essential oils 
Um, uh, I love working for a company that uh, does something to improve you know, the quality of life of people. I use about 36 of the products myself regularly. We have about 400 SKUs. I don't look that good, my joke is I don't look that good, <laughs> but when you realize I'm 140 years old, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you know. that might be a bit of an advertisement for using them. Um, we're just celebrated our 20th year um, in 2014. Um, uh, we. Uh, uh, brand ourselves as the world leader of essential oils. Uh, we do have competitors now, um, and they have uh, uh, been trained uh, by us so they could go out and continue to, to carry that forward. Uh, I've said today when we're talking to the city uh, or the county commissioners that we're a little bit like New Skin. New Skin was kind of the mother for all the direct sales companies, and, and we become in a small way kind of the mother for essential oil companies. Um, uh, we're privately owned by Gary and Mary Young. Um, uh, Gary is, I refer to him as kind of a renaissance man. He's been everything from an ice road trucker to a uh, farmer to an author to a scientist to a, to a businessman. Uh, we get to see him in the office a few days every month. Uh, most recently he's been up in Canada uh, uh, acquiring a farm. We call it our Northern Lights farm where uh, he's up there uh, uh, finding more black spruce for us, and we will reforest that we do that, and uh, helping us to stay up with the demand for some of the more and more difficult to source oils. Um, he's still discovering oils, which is one of the reasons we refer to ourselves as the world leader. He still goes off. He spent three years recently in Ecuador and introduced a lot of oils at that time when he was down there uh, starting a farm and, and other uh, ventures. Um, we have farms around the world. We have the one that you know about in Mona, hopefully. Uh, we have uh, two farms in Idaho. We have a farm in France. Uh, we have a farm in Oman. Uh, we have a farm in Ecuador. We have a farm in Peru, and I know I miss some. We also have a lot of cooperative ventures. Uh, we work with farmers throughout the world. Uh, these oils are grown throughout numerous climates, but uh, we have a standard. Every oil that comes in is tested to a standard. We don't share that standard with anyone else. We don't even share it with our vendors. If they miss the mark, then we send you know, it, it, it's, it's not our standard. Send us another sample because we don't want them to go back and just put an additive in it to, to, uh, uh, to, to make it up to our standard. We struggle with a few areas of the world where they tend to, to do that. It's a little bit like we said, like if you have 1% milk and you want 2% milk, somebody might just add a little butter fat to it. So we don't do that, but we have the standard. Um, we're uh, vertically integrated, unlike our competitors. Uh, we talk about being from seed to seal. Uh, that's from uh, what type of seed we put in the ground, what type of soil we put in the ground, when we cultivate, how we distill. Uh, Gary is one of the innovators for uh, distilling. We have some of the largest uh, uh, distilleries in the world. Um, uh, we test, as we said, against uh, our standard, and then we uh, seal to uh, ensure that we have the purity. Our sales history, just briefly, and I'm almost done, our sales history has been rather um, uh, standard for the period I've been here. I've been with the company about 11 years. Uh, we've been experiencing kind of the 8 to 12, 15 percent a year growth. Two years ago, we had a, uh, um, a dramatically different year, uh, 30, 40 percent increase. And then last year, we uh, broke triple digits. And uh, uh, that's stressed the infrastructure. Uh, if you take uh, a year of 10 percent and, uh, and put that into uh, uh, you know, uh, one year and multiply it by 10, it's 10 years into one, and it's been a little bit stressful. It's been a little bit stressful for us with regard to also uh, capitalizing that. It's created a challenge. And uh, as we've looked to uh, find additional space, you know, uh, I'm sure you're aware that we've just received an award from the uh, state of Utah. Uh, we've been out uh, uh, checking our options, trying to be good businessmen and make sure that we know what our options are and had offers from other states. But the state has now given us an, an award. Uh, uh, not as lucrative as, uh, 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 as some of our offers, but uh, uh, our homes here, we have most of our staff. 
Our corporate headquarters in Lehigh at the current time, we occupy about 20, 120, 130,000 square feet, about five or six different buildings and Thanksgiving yeah, Park. The corporate offices. So that's one of our challenges to find a property here in hopefully Utah County and to uh, build the global headquarters and to uh, stop leasing and, and, and build our uh, future uh, global headquarters there. So we've had that award and uh, we've also been looking at uh, where to place call center, where to place uh, our, what we call our manufacturing production fulfillment facility. And uh, we have the property here to do some expansion. We also have warehouses throughout the uh, world. Um, Tokyo, Mexico City, um, just outside of London, uh, uh, in Australia, Brisbane, um, and I'm going to miss some in Ecuador uh, where we send our product. But this is the uh, core of all that. This is where we prepare not only the shipments to people in the United States and Canada, but we send bulk shipments down to those satellite warehouses out of, out of here. Um, but it's created a challenge uh, on our capital, and uh, that's one of the reasons we're seeking, uh, you know, uh, these incentives. As you look at what we're going to spend, you know, 15 to 28 million dollars, it may seem like these incentives are, are are a small percentage of that, but it adds up, and and so we're trying to to do that. But we have demands. Inventory is one. As we've gone into this unusual, exceptional period of sales, we've had to uh, store more inventory. A lot of our uh, a product is annually uh, harvested, so we have to have enough to last us till the next harvest. We just did inventory last Saturday, and we had three times the inventory in that little building that we had a year ago. And so money's gone towards inventory. Um, we're uh, uh, money's going towards more lease space, uh, towards uh, uh, additional material handling equipment. We designed that building with the ability to not only expand out, but up. So we've just added a work deck and additional conveyor and systems inside that building. We have a lot of demands uh, uh, recently to keep up with all the testing, the scientific uh, machinery to do our testing. Um, and so uh, as we process more samples and more product, we have more testing equipment uh, and farms, farms and distilleries. And so that's why we're here seeking uh, the incentives um, and, uh, we uh, appreciate it. Uh, we would like very much to stay in Spanish Fork. Uh, I, I'm uh, glad that we haven't had any public comment, uh, uh, it, you know, in the negative. But uh, we're open to suggestions. We once again want to be good citizens. We love your, we love the uh, workforce that you provide for us and the people here and. Uh, uh, I guess the last thing I said is if we had to, perhaps we should uh, include in this a steak and seafood <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> Why, there you go, and know. you've got it made. <laughs> that might be the... That might be the... <laughs> seals the deal. It, it definitely would seal the deal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. We appreciate you, and we appreciate what you've done here, and uh, we want you to... We appreciate all you've done, we want to keep you here. Know that. Yeah, so. I, was, I was just going to add one quick thought as, as broker real estate agents, our job is to present clients with all the options. And more times than not, they want the best deal. That's, that's the criteria and everything else kind of comes second. But what this city did when Young Living first came here, it was a complete night and day on welcoming them, getting things approved, getting things approved quickly. Uh, you could call even the mayor, anybody would be responsive. Dave Oler played an incremental part in making that happen. So that had a lot to do with the decision to hopefully stay here. And even though there were better deals on the table, uh, Ron always wanted to make sure not only to give you a chance, but make every effort we could for them to stay here. Because that's how highly they think of you. So right. I just wanted Thank to you. Know. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, is there anyone that would like to address from the public uh, this issue? Can I ask a question? Come up here and state your name. Uh, Randy Chipman. I was just curious. I'm not obviously very well educated on the whole project, but I was curious to quantify maybe those numbers. That what I thought there was a number mentioned for the total tax incentive versus how many estimated jobs we would 
permanent full-time jobs we would expect and things like that is there a quantify to put those put numbers on that chart and the jobs that would correspond to that sure I yeah <coughs> I appreciate that and uh, one note that I made after I sat down the thing I knew I was forgetting and I think Ron touched on this um, in order for Young Living to receive the full benefit they need to employ 200 new full-time employees so that's that's a threshold that's that's part of the arrangement that's before you tonight um, and uh, get to the right part of the benefit analysis. Hey, that did, by the way, I'm sorry, that didn't include a lot of conversion of temp employees to right. full-time employees exactly. as well. We had at one point several months ago 181 temp employees that we were just trying to continue to bring them in and, and uh, uh, convert them as we found uh, you know, them to be suitable for our environment. Page five is where I was looking, Dave, that two, 200 full-time employees at 41,800, you know, salary benefit packages. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So, again, that's one of the, uh, the requisite uh, criteria that would have to be met by Young Living in order for them to qualify um, for the incentive that we're talking about tonight. Um, in terms of uh, new tax revenue that would be generated... Um, and I'll welcome anybody here. Yeah, it's more than that. I've really just focused on uh, the maximum potentially that Young Living could receive through uh, the increment that would be generated, um, which is 68% of it, and again, that's $1.7 million. Um, looking now at the... Uh, so now I keep going back to the schedules. Page six of six, the plan? Six, yeah, six in the middle of that paragraph. The 1.7 is capped, but it's estimated at 1.85 million of the six, the, that's the 68%. 68 68%. Then we'd be getting a maximum of 1.14, or excuse me, 870,276. Which would go to the taxing entities, right? Well, so it's the yeah, 870 so plus the 1.8. Correct. Is the total. And so layman's terms, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if this is the place to say it, but to try to, in the 10-year period, Randy, you're talking about basically saying 68% of that, what might they might get as a benefit is 1.7 capped out. And it would be that we're getting, instead of nothing, 870,276 over a 10-year period, not including 200 new jobs at $42,000 a year. I don't know. Quick, rough? Yeah, I think that's fine. Sounds like a banker. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right. Sounds like a hometown farm banker. Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank okay, you. thank you. <laughs> Anything, anybody else? If not, I'd entertain a motion to go out of public hearing. Before we do that, by purposes of the act, uh, at least in the minutes, we need to show that we have also afforded the taxing entities an opportunity to be heard. So those are uh, the, the city, Utah County, Nebo School District, Central Utah Water Conservancy District, and Springville Drainage District. Uh, I don't know, Commissioner, if you wanted to address anything, but at least in the minutes, we need to note that we've uh, given the opportunity to the taxing entities to make some statement as well and uh, you know after that or if there are none then we can close the public hearing. Commissioner would you like to come up and only because you asked me to. <laughs> well good. Gosh we, I, I like you to come anytime. You know it's just good to see your smiling face. Uh, we recognize that uh, that this has been something that's been in the making 
here in Spanish Fork for a while. And uh, we've had some meetings with you. We've met a few times and have some information on it. <clears throat> and uh, I think generally speaking in the past, you could you can say that we have been supportive of these things, recognizing a significant change in the uh, in the numbers of commissioners, uh, and I have two new ones that I'm working with right now. I don't know for sure how they will come down on this, but uh, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to participate with you. So I'm so. But uh, I'll have to get at least one more of them. So <laughs> <laughs> I may have to call on you to come in first. Well, yeah. <laughs> seems like you've had a busy two days anyway. What's that? Probably had a busy two days anyway. It has been. I've survived a full day and a half after they've been sworn in. So. There you go. <laughs> well, if you, we got people. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, obviously, the the goal is to try and do good things, and and I think some some people in their thinking they they look at it a little bit differently and and uh, one of the questions that is asked sometimes is well how do you level the playing field in fact I took the opportunity after we had the presentation this morning to sit down and, and just give some information a little bit of an overview with the with the commissioners in terms of uh, RDAs EDAs CDAs and, and the way they work and all and, and the reason why we do these things and that was one of the questions that was asked is from, from one of the commissioners uh, expressing a little bit of concern and saying, saying well, how, if we do this for, for one, how about the next guy that asks and the next guy? Says, well, it's a case-by-case -case basis. You look at them all and try and make the best decision you can as they come down the line. And, and sometimes it's a matter of, uh, of helping to get things started in an area and, and that you don't necessarily uh, have to treat everyone equally so much as you try and be fair with people as they come. So I. Uh, attempted to uh, to lay the groundwork. I don't know how successful, but we'll probably uh, have to have the city come back and uh, when we actually get it on. Today was just a work meeting. We don't have, have not had it actually on the. On One good thing to look agenda. at is the things that trigger the incentives. Yes, and that's and that's something that we'll want to make sure that we're understanding and and just how you're planning on all of that working in terms of the the post performance and. Uh, and the nature of what you're proposing so so we'll be excited to have you come back and, uh, and talk with us about that and get it on an actual agenda for that wonderful okay thanks, thanks commissioner. commissioner all right now i'd entertain a motion to go out of public hearing so moved second Got a motion by uh, councilman gordon a second by councilman mendenhall all in favor say aye aye any opposed At this point, it's time to hopefully adopt some findings, make some findings and adopt them. Uh, at that point, then we can proceed to uh, pass the resolution which approves the plan which has been presented. Uh, so for the record, I'm going to take a little longer than I usually do, but I'm going to read the proposed findings uh, that our RDA attorney has indicated we need to make in order to comply with the provisions of the law. So the findings are as follows. The adoption of the plan area, or the adoption of the project area plan will, one, satisfy a public purpose by, among other things, encouraging and accomplishing appropriate development and economic development within the project area. Two, provide a public benefit, as shown by the benefit analysis, included in the project area plan, as required pursuant to section 17C-4-2. 103 subparagraph 11 of the act three be economically sound and feasible it is expected that the private sector will perform required construction and installation relating to projects and any related funding from the agency will be pursuant to interlocal agreements entered into between the agency and one or more taxing entities and or by way of grants received by the agency four conform to spanish work city's general plan also, the plan provides that all development in the project area is to be in accordance with the city's zoning ordinances and requirements. And lastly, promote the public peace, health, safety, and welfare of Spanish Fork City. So if the board feels uh, that you can adopt those findings, it would be appropriate this time to uh, take a motion making those findings and uh, adopting those findings.
So we need a. We just need to make a motion to approve those findings. Findings. Make and then adopt those findings. Yes. So moved. A motion by Councilman Davis. Second. Second by Councilman Scobes. We don't need a roll call on this, do we? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. That. Now, now, with the adoption of the findings, we need to adopt uh, the plan. There is a resolution in your packet that does that. So we now need a, a motion. Excuse me, a motion to adopt resolution RDA number 1501, which approves, adopts and approves the Sierra Bonita Community Development Project Area Plan dated November 28, 2014. Motion to approve resolution 15-01. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Davis, a second by Councilman Dart. This is a, uh, will be a roll call vote. Uh, Councilman Gordon. Aye. Councilman Mendenhall. Aye. Councilman Scope. Aye. Councilman Dart. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. It approved. Passes. Thank you. Now that we've uh, adopted the plan, in order to fund the plan, we need to approve the interlocal agreements. That's where the tax increment monies uh, will come to the agency. It's because of these other tax entities are agreeing to do so. So on the agenda tonight, we have uh, an interlocal agreement with the city, with Nebo School District, with Central Utah Water Conservancy District, and with Utah County. We've heard from Commissioner Allardson that the county is still considering that. Uh, this is on the agenda for Nebo School District next week at their board meeting. It's also on the agenda for Central Utah Water for their January board meeting. We've been working with Springville Drainage District. Uh, we're not quite there with them yet, but we're getting encouraging results back. So these interlocal agreements, uh, I'm going to talk about them in a group, but when we adopt them, adopt them each by separate resolution, if you will. And when I say that, uh, you know, the other entities haven't acted upon you, them yet. Uh, two of them will act this month. The county will, will act one way or the other, uh, probably this month as well, but, but shortly. Uh, so we need to approve them, then they can approve them. Once we both approved them, uh, we'll need to publish a summary of them. We can do that uh, jointly, and then they become effective. These agreements with all but uh, the school district, I'm going to touch on them in a little bit. Uh, these entities are authorizing the county assessor when they receive the tax entity's share of the new tax increment that they'll send 68% of that to the agency and 32% of that uh, they'll keep and distribute uh, back to the taxing entity. Out of that 68%, 3% of that will be used for administrative expenses. Most of that will go to Mr. File, who's been our RDA attorney. We've had some other expenses. We'll have some publication expenses coming forward. Uh, we'll have a few other expenses moving, moving forward. Now, typically, we take 5% because this is a one-owner project. Uh, we've anticipated that we be, should be able to cut our costs. We've, we've taken 3%, and that gives the taxing entities an extra 2%. Uh, so the interlocal agreements uh, do that. Now, the school district is a little bit different. They have asked that 100% of the increment come to the agency rather than just 68%. And then in our agreement with the school district, the agency will take the 32% and pass on to the school district. Uh, the net result is the same for all of the entities. But because of uh, the laws that the school district has to deal with, this allows them a little bit more freedom in how they can use that 32%. And so they are the major taxing entity. Uh, most of our, if you look at your tax, but most of that bill goes to the school district. And so we, we think, you know, they've been a great team player over the years as we've done this. And if we can help them by honoring that request, then you know, we feel we should step up and do that. So again, the net result is the same. You need to understand that. But we will, as an agency, have to pass on part of that because we'll receive all of theirs. The others will just receive 68%. So questions about any of that? With that then, Mayor, it would be appropriate to adopt a resolution for both Spanish Fork City, Utah County, Nebo School District, Central Utah Water Conservancy District. Then we'll have to come back at a future time we get uh, Springville drainage done and approve that one, uh, which looks pretty promising at this point. But So is that resolution 15-05? There, there should be separate resolutions for each of them. 
So we have 15, we have two, three, four, and five that needs to be approved tonight. And then the Springville drainage. We'll do that at a future date. So you just want, do you want them separately? Separately? Please. Okay, so. Motion to, oh, go ahead. I make a motion we approve the resolution RDA number 15-02, interlocal agreement with Central Utah Water Con Confer Convergency District. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Dart and uh, second by Councilman Davis. Uh, we'll do this by roll call vote. Uh, Councilman Mendenhall. Aye. Councilman Scobes. Aye. Councilman Dart. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Gordon. Aye. Okay, that approve passes. Motion to approve RDA resolution 15-03, approving the interlocal agreement with Naval School District. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Davis, a second by Councilman Mendenhall. We'll do this at roll call. Uh, Councilman Scobes. Aye. Councilman Dart. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Gordon. Aye. Councilman Mendenhall. Aye. Aye, that and passes. Motion to approve RDA resolution 15-04, approving an interlocal agreement with the Spanish Fork City. Um, with Spanish Fork City. With Spanish Fork City. Okay. Second. The RDA. Uh, motion by Councilman Davis, second by Councilman Scopes. Roll call vote. Councilman Dart. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Gordon. Aye. Councilman Mendenhall. Aye. Councilman Scobes. Aye. That one passes. I move that we approve RDA Resolution 15-05 with Utah County Interlocal Agreement. Second. A motion by Councilman Scobes, a second by Councilman Mendenhall. This will be a roll call vote. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Gordon. Aye. Councilman Mendenhall. Aye. Councilman Scobes. Aye. Councilman Dart. Aye. That passes. If there's no more agency business, we can go back to city council. Motion to go back into city council. Second. Oh, wait, wait, Commissioner Elders, go on up here. Can I put a PS on? Okay. You bet you. You can do anything you want because we like you. Wow, wow, wow. Get <laughs> 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 that written down. <clears throat> Didn't get there. Yeah, darn. No, I, uh, I was just thinking that uh, over the years that I've had the opportunity of working with the city and, and various RDAs, EDAs, CDAs, uh, uh, it uh, becomes very evident, and I compliment the city on their judicious manner in the way that you have managed in, uh, your affairs in terms of the way you deal with, with these types of things. In terms of uh, uh, the term, the amount, uh, and actually letting them expire at the end of their uh, initial period and those kinds of things. And I've said this before, Dave. I, I, I hope you've heard me say this before. But but uh, not everyone does it as, as well as Spanish Fork City does. You just need to know that, and we compliment you for that. So. Hey, thank you. I sure appreciate that. I'm going to excuse myself. <laughs> You're excused. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Come anytime. Motion to go out. Motion to go. Motion to go. <laughs> motion to go back into city council. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Davis, a second by Councilman Gordon to go back into regular meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 We are now back. Now that you have your city council hats on, uh, we have a couple of items of business that relate to the, the RDA business. The first thing is we need to adopt an ordinance by the city now, not the agency which uh, accepts and approves the Sierra Bonita project area plan. So you have that ordinance in your uh, packet. We need to, to go ahead and approve the ordinance now that the agency has adopted that plan. Okay, I would move we approve ordinance number 01-15, ordinance of the City Council of Spanish Work City, State of Utah, uh, adopting ordinance 115. I lost it. That's all right. Got a motion by Councilman Dart. Second. Second by Councilman Mendenhall. 
Uh, roll call vote on this. Uh, Councilman Gordon? Aye. Councilman Mendenhall? Aye. Councilman Scope? Aye. Councilman Dart? Aye. Councilman Davis? Aye. Okay, that one. The next item of business also relates to the RDA. Uh, as you recall, in the RDA, we approved an interlocal agreement between the agency and the city. Well, the city now needs to approve that as well so that we can, both entities can sign it, and that will be, be enforced. That will be the first interlocal entity to kick off this new CDA. Okay. Motion to approve resolution 15-01, Spanish Fork City approving an interlocal agreement with the Spanish Fork RDA. Second. A motion by Councilman Gordon, a second by Councilman Davis. Uh, roll call again. Councilman uh, Mendenhall. Aye. Councilman Scobes. Aye. Councilman Dart. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Gordon. Aye, aye. That also passes. Okay. Uh, that takes care of a lot of that. Mayor. Yo, there you are. <laughs> Speak to me. Let me just take a minute and explain because we really don't go into RDA a lot. And just to make sure everybody is familiar with some of the things we do and have done with the redevelopment agency. The redevelopment agency is a separate government entity. You people wear the, a different hat when you function as a redevelopment agency. What we've done through the years, uh, Commissioner Ellertson kind of alluded to some of that, but when you look up here at the map, Kirby Lane RDA and North Industrial Park RDA were the first two industrial uh, agencies, redevelopment agencies that we put together. And because of those, you can see the old uh, Banda Press building here. Jahabo was the industry that located here. Uh, off the map down here is the Finger Hut building. Over here you have the Kirby building, which started out as Kirby Building Company that built big buildings, manufactured big buildings. They went out of business for 10 years. Crisona Aluminum from Crisona, Pennsylvania came out and looked at this building and said we'd like to buy it and locate there. So we put together the Kirby Lane RDA in order to accommodate Crisona Aluminum. Uh, Finger Hut came in. We did uh, an RDA for the Finger Hut building and that's what allowed them to come in. When the Finger Hut building RDA increment was completed, as Commissioner Ellertson indicated, the city basically stopped the increment and now the money started going back to the school district, the county, and the other entities. Uh, you've got some of these other RDAs that have been put together. Some of them are inactive at this time. The Swenson RDA is inactive. The Dominguez is inactive. Uh, but these RDAs are there ready to uh, accommodate accommodate uh, future industry if we need to. You have the windmill project that was put together through the RDA. Um, that possibly wouldn't have happened without the RDA. You have the Costco project here that was put together through a CDA. Uh, so, and then Gateway out here, which was the old Provo Craft project. Uh, along with the original Young Living and then this new RDA or CDA that we've created is basically within that area. So there's a lot of use that we've had through the redevelopment agency and a lot of industry that's been located in our community because we've been able to use this as a tool. And some of these industries, I know there's one industry that was looking out in this area years ago and you know we went back to Chicago to to visit with them uh, they ended up getting a better deal up in Twin Falls because that community put together a better incentive package than we could put together uh, Mayor Huff and I went to uh, 
Missouri and basically went out and visited the Jehabo facility. And as we visited them, they came back in and they located here uh, just south of Longview Fiber. So there's a lot of these industries that uh, have been able to come about because of the use of the incentives that are provided through the redevelopment agency. And we've had other entities besides just the county. I know the school district has expressed appreciation to the city for ending the redevelopment agency, the increment, when it needed to be ended. And we've done that on many of these uh, projects. So uh, this is a, a very important tool that we've used, and I think we've used it responsibly through the years. So I just wanted to add that information. Appreciate that. Thanks, yeah. David. That's almost as good as 101. <laughs> for, so. Well, I think from a, I, just quickly to piggyback, I mean, that stands out to me as far as looking at numbers all day for work and then being able to see something to echo what Ron says and, and Commissioner Ellerson said. I mean, good, good job to Spanish Fork City staff. I think the citizens need to know what's immediate right now is in our North Park area where we're waiting for a steakhouse to come and people are wondering, well, what are we doing, city, to get, you know, to get that to happen? Well, quietly in the background of something just happening here, we potentially created, you know, not created, the company created, but we facilitated a place for 200 more jobs in our community and, you know, that much more tax revenue for our citizens. And, and those are real numbers, $42,000 in a living wage for 200 more people. So it, it just seems like a success story and citizens ought to know that your city staff working hard, Dave and Seth and Dave and junior and everybody working hard to do that is uh, you know those are real figures that make a difference so kind of quiet behind the scenes but I don't know really need to see come to fruition if it if it can so right all right <laughs>
uh, cases where other cities have had problems. And so basically this states that when specialized engineering has to be submitted on a development project, then uh, the developer will bear the cost for our specialized engineers that are competent to review it, to, to review it. So would, would that have solved our problem with the floodplain issue? I, I believe it would have. Actually, and that cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to correct that problem. Yeah, between three and four hundred thousand dollars. So that would have would have saved us quite a bit of money. All right. So going down, um, one of the things that that we are detailing here, and this this is coming out of recommendations from our uh, transportation element of the general plan, but a maximum of fifty units will be allowed uh, on, in a subdivision where you have one access out onto the collector arterial roads. Uh, w what, we, what we don't want is, is uh, basically a, a dead end subdivision to get too big before a second access is opened up. Um, uh, one of the things we, we have a, an allowable grade standard, and there's two changes that, that, that we are proposing here that are significant. One is, is we are applying the allowable grades to driveways as well. We, we've had recently some very steep driveways proposed, and uh, we feel like to protect the future homeowner, we, we need to put a limit on what a driveway grade can be. Also, uh, with low impact development, uh, we are finding that we can lower the grade, the minimum grade in a development, and let it flatten out and, and not require as much fill material to build developments. And, and so that is being proposed to go down to a 0.35 if LID principles are being used in the development. Now, at one time, when I first came to work here, uh, our minimum grade was 0.3. That's very difficult to, to pour a curb and gutter at a point three. Uh, point three five is also uh, really, uh, really flat, but if you have lots of inlets into LID, it works fine. So, uh, going on. That. Okay, so we used to do a one inch overlay. Um, we're transitioning to only requiring a preservation coat. We find it's better to just put your asphalt down in the thickness it needs to be and then preserve it with a seal coat uh, r right after. Uh, another change is, and we just passed it, but that's fine, is there is a pipe that's that's being used quite a bit now. Uh, it's, a, it's a corrugated uh, polyethylene pipe uh, which comes in larger sizes and is, is actually very uh, strong and works very well in sewers. In the past, we've only allowed PVC pipe up, up to the 12-inch size, and then after that, they have to use concrete pipe uh, for large sewer lines. Uh, the problem with concrete pipe is uh, hydrogen so sulfide gases get in there and they really corrode the pipe. And, and there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, this new pipe uh, actually has, doesn't have that problem at all. It's a lot easier to install. It comes in 20 foot lengths that can be installed instead of eight foot lengths. And uh, uh, it works, works very well. And, and, and the sewer lines hold up a lot longer. We, we tested this and allowed it in in a project there in the Walmart area and in a couple other projects over the last two or three years and are very happy with it. And, and what the report's coming in from other cities and, 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 and DOTs that are using it are very good. So uh, we are now requiring that over concrete. So uh, we don't allow the concrete anymore. And uh, that, that will allow those pipes to, to uh, hold up a lot longer. Uh, 
I'm going to talk about all of this when we look at the standard drawings. So we can keep going. Okay, so you'll notice that we deleted the hillside uh, site development. Uh, we're, we are working on a whole new standard for some of the more uh, often used specialized engineering. So like hillside development, erosion control, uh, geotech. And we have a draft form of that. It's going to the DRC next week. And we will add that in and get that to you. But in the in February, you should have a, a so, final so version. Do you have something that will follow any geotech study that needs to be revamped, revisioned in some of our stuff? So, so if, if there is a study that we feel is not adequate in existing subdivisions, we require that update before the house is built. Our goal is to get all that work done before a building permit is pulled so that the developer uh, bears the cost of what is it going to take to build a house on this lot and then it, it protects future lot buyers and homeowners to say oh, well actually there's gonna have to be a lot more done on the foundation here because of these issues and that's that's no more up front and, and the cost to do these specialized engineering studies are a lot less if you're doing it for a whole development versus making each individual lot owner pay for those individual studies so Economically, as a you know, looking at it from 5,000 feet, it's a lot better this way financially as well. Because each lot could be different, especially up in the hills. And exactly, and we we are requiring a lot by lot type study or summary, I guess, so that each lot knows what what they need to do in order to build. Uh, one of the the really good changes I feel like that we are proposing is to have the uh, utilities measured from the lip of gutter instead of from the center line of the road. Uh, when you measure from the center line of the road uh, on your arterials and collector roads, you have all the utilities in the travel lanes. Whereas if you measure from the edge of the gutter, on those bigger roads, you're keeping it more in the shoulder. And uh, I think that's where we really want our utilities. It's still consistent, the developers and engineers know exactly where the utilities are at every time, but we're measuring from the edge of the gutter instead of the center line. So that's a pretty, pretty good change. Now storm drain, it doesn't matter as much since you have to go both directions to the uh, inlet boxes. And so we're putting that at the center. This is a pretty good change right here. Um, we, we are installing our valves at the T's and crosses in, in our intersections. Uh, it's, we feel like that's a lot better design. Um, but with that, you, you end up with valves really close together. And if you put your concrete collars around, you have some pretty creative looks. It, it just looks bad and the concrete doesn't hold up as well, I feel like, and it also the asphalt, you have lots of points in the asphalt, which, which, which I don't believe will hold up very well at all. So we came up with some standards of if you have three valves or four or two, this is how we want it to look. Okay, here's, here's one. And, and, and this, uh, this is becoming really popular with, with a lot of cities in, in putting a concrete uh, apron around their fire hydrants um, to keep uh, weeds or, or things to be planted that might obstruct the hydrants. Uh, so quite a few cities have adopted that. We've had a similar standard with our electrical boxes for some time uh, and we feel like it will work well with fire hydrants as well. So pretty minor changes. Okay, so going back up, most all the changes are in red except for on whole new standards. We just put the standard name in red. So this is a whole new standard that didn't exist before. This is 
a, a, a residential LID uh, inlet box, how it connects to our, our underground infiltration uh, system. Uh, we've, we have actually tested that in two subdivisions over this last year, and they seem to work v very well. Um, we've had 20 to 30 cities come and learn from us how, how we are doing this. And I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll see a similar standard being done throughout the state. So this kind of gives you a viewpoint of how the LID works. You basically have an infiltration system here. You have your inlet here. This is set level with some minimums and some maximum depths. Uh, when, when this becomes too high or this too little, then you have to start a new one. You have a gap. But the idea is water comes down the curb and gutter. It enters into the LID inlet box. It fills up this underground detention um, and then if it ever gets full, now, now it's important to realize this is a hundred year storm worth of volume. Say that, hundred year, <laughs> here comes this hundred year storm. <laughs> it should not get full very often, but it does seem like we have some pretty good storms every once in a while. But that being said, it should not get full very often. And then if it did get full, let's say you had a water main break right here, you're gonna fill this up, right? Uh, there's always an overflow that goes out, which eventually will be to a storm drain pipe and to some detention basins. But what this does is it attenuates the water so that you don't have the peak flows of water coming into your pipes, so your pipes can be smaller. Typically in a storm drain system, you, you calculate what the time of concentration is and the peak flow of water. And so you might only have a five minute or even a two minute interval where you have the large CFS maybe 50 CFS of water hit that pipe, but you have to design it for the 50 CFS. Uh, this attenuates the water and just gradually lets it into your piping system so that you never see that big peak. And so it, basically what it does is it makes your piping systems become a lot smaller, but it also pushes them out. Part of our lowering the grades on our subdivisions so they're flatter uh, also makes it so that eventually you know, everything has to be flowing at an angle. Well, eventually, you might, you might run out of grade and, and uh, have to start climbing and then go down again. At those points, there will have to be a storm drain system. But that storm drain system will be smaller. It will be pushed further out from the development. And it will go to LID detention, which is designed to handle 95% of the rest of the water. And those also will be smaller. And so overall, the goal is to make it so that at the end of the pipe that goes to the river, you rarely, if ever, see water uh, going into the river, which we feel eventually will need to be treated. And that will be very expensive. So those are just connections on LID. Now here's a pretty good uh, change from um, what we presented to you last year as we wanted to experiment with LID. Um, we are finding that along collector and arterial roads, uh, it works better to use a storm tech system instead of the milk crate system, if that makes a little more sense. Storm tech system is, is basically a half pipe uh, with rock and uh, uh, fabric around it. Uh, the storm tech system, you can put manholes onto it and you can clean it. And so it's much like a pipe but it, it works very well for this type of, of situation where uh, in along a collector and arterial road, you can put manholes, large boxes, and, 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 and that's uh, usually not a problem. And, and so this is, this is the collector road LID system um, versus uh, in the residential, we just want it all to be hidden. We don't so want- Is the pipe solid or is it perforated? It's perforated you know, up the first uh, 18 inches of it, uh, solid on top. Uh, most of the water goes into the ground through the bottom. It actually sits on a bed of rock, and then the fabric is around the rock. Now, that works very, a lot better than um, a French drain, which a French drain is designed to gather in water from the ground and drain it out. Well, French drains, we have a history of them 
clogging the fabric because the water is coming from where the dirty silt is into the rock. And so the fabric keeps the silt back, but the silt has a, a, a tendency of clogging up the fabric and eventually French drains seem to fail. This is the opposite system. The water comes in clean. We have uh, the snout system to keep garbage out of it. Uh, even if garbage got by it, this is cleanable, that is cleanable. Uh, what, but the water is introduced into the rock and then it's clean and it pushes out into the ground. And so uh, the feeling is this will last a very long time, if not indefinitely. And even if it did uh, stop working as well, uh, they're cleanable. You can see that. That would work great because that's the problem it's with French drains that comes in. Not that. Exactly. And so for those of you who know a little bit of, about French drains, initially there's a little bit of concern here. But I think we've done a pretty good job of listing out all of the fatal flaws and addressing them. One, one innovation that came out of the DRC, though, uh, that I thought was really good, and it allows us to put the, street, the trees more in the center of the planter, is we pushed uh, the LID up next to the sidewalk, um, which then kind of protects the sidewalk from the roots of the trees, as well as allows us to plant the trees in the center of the planter so that they don't overhang the road or the or, or the sidewalk too much. So I thought that was a pretty good innovation that came out of DRC. Okay. All right, now we have the road cross sections. And you better go back to that top one. It's probably the most controversial. <laughs> All right, so, right. so one, one, of the, one of the important things about uh, LID is, <laughs> is, is the Reader's, mayor, Reader's uh, Digest. The mayor was telling you to do that? Okay. <laughs> Warm peace. <laughs> One of the important concepts of LID is minimize pervious area. And so don't build your streets wider than they need to be. Have more impervious areas as much as you can. So this does have the narrow cross section, which is 29 feet of asphalt or 33 feet of, of, of driving area from curb to curb. So that is something to, to really take a hard look at. Um, uh, we as staff recommend it like it's safer and it's better. It's, it's lower cost to maintain and uh, makes for uh, a much nicer neighborhood. Uh, that being said, there's also a residential you're losing us. <laughs> okay, well, on a side note, Richard. <laughs> oh. Ouch. <laughs> Start over. I know Start over. We I lost know this. Is really Start exciting. over. When did, when did I lose you? <laughs> we'll go back. Oh, I, go I, I, can start, I can start from wherever I lost you. We, we've talked, the, okay, we've well. talked about this a lot of times. <laughs> This is, this is our first rodeo with this. I, I know what we go through. Hey, you know, we're going to go home and go through this whole thing, so it's okay. All right, well, I, I just got to get one last, well, maybe two more. Uh, one, of the, one of the major changes that came in our transportation element of the general plan that we brought is we wanted a different cross-section for each uh, number of lane roads. Uh, we don't want two different cross-sections that has cross sections that have three lanes. We just wanted one two lane, one three lane, one four lane, or five lane, one seven lane. And so this introduces a minor collector road, which is a two lane collector road. Uh, and then all the rest have adjusted accordingly. And they also have the LID in it. So that's a big change. Okay, going down. Uh, one, two, two last things. One is our electric. Uh, you know how we talked about, let's go down to the electric really quick. Okay, stop right there. Before in the electric, we just put concrete right here to, to make sure that we'd have good access to our boxes. Uh, it worked fine, it looked awful. It just looks really bad. And it doesn't protect us from having weeds and stuff growing around the electrical boxes. So 
uh, similar to how the, the fire hydrants are, these are going to be aprons instead. And uh, it'll, it will keep the weeds from growing into the electric boxes all the way around it. And uh, it also, I think, will look a lot better. Going back up um, on our parking lots, uh, we changed. Go back up more. Okay, so on our parking lots, a little bit more, right here. This was 24 feet. We changed that to 26. Uh, that's more of a industry standard and uh, is much more comfortable to drive in, especially if have, if you have a truck. Going down one more, and this is my last comment. Promise. Promise. And this is, uh, okay, this includes the reduced width intersection. So here's, here's the standard for a T-type reduced width. If it was a, a, a cross-type intersection, you would have this on the other side. Any questions? Thanks, Chris. No questions at Chris, all? <laughs> Sorry, you can talk to him on your own time. <laughs> Appreciate that. No, you can ask it if you want to. I just thought maybe you guys would want to know. I noticed that the bond didn't change from 15% to 10%. That's a large amount. Well, that's state law. We're, you're bound by that. Yep. State law changed that, huh? Yeah. Okay. I move we go into closed session for land transaction. Second. Got a motion by Councilman Dart, a second by Councilman Davis. Going to closed session. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned.